It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you at this year's summit about how you can approach getting to net zero with the actions that you're taking to reduce your carbon emissions. What I'd like to talk to you today about is though how we get to net zero safely. And I'm coming at this as a climate scientist, somebody who's worked in climate modelling all my career and have seen the story of climate change unfold over those decades till we're now at this place where we are talking about getting ourselves to net zero by 2050. But I want to approach this a little bit differently from talking about carbon emissions and mitigation strategies to talk about all the other things that will affect us as we, we make that transition. Because climate change is here to stay and we're already feeling its bite actually, as we know from this past summer with unprecedented uh, temperatures, unprecedented wildfires and including some really devastating flooding events around the world. So what I want to talk to you about today is the fact that we're actually taking our planet into uncharted territory. We haven't been where we are today for a very, very long time. And so we don't know where we're going, what path we're going to follow. And so there are some really big questions we have to think about beyond just reducing our carbon emissions. And here are some that, that I want to talk through today. First of all, how well do we know today's baseline climate risks from extreme weather and climate hazards, just from natural variability? How much were the wildfires and extreme temperatures in North America this summer just because the weather was doing something unusual? We don't really know. How confident are we about, therefore, how our climate risks will evolve from today's baseline? And again, I'm going to spend probably most of the talk on this particular topic, because despite the fact that we have had just had the sixth assessment report published of the, the physical science basis, uh, for that for that report. We know that there are some really big issues in the climate models that we still need to address. And then of course, and this is really relevant to, to the main thrust of your, your meeting this year, which is about mitigation and reducing our emissions, is how might new knowledge of climate and earth system responses affect the pace and depth of mitigation actions to stay within the Paris target and achieve net zero by 2050. And that means understanding and knowing with somewhat more confidence than we do now what the sensitivity of our climate system is to increasing carbon dioxide levels. I mean, we know that the climate sensitivity is anything, anywhere between two and probably five and a half degrees. And that's a big difference as to how we approach a net zero point. And what will the carbon cycle feedbacks in the terrestrial and marine systems, how will they continue to buffer our emissions? Will they be as good as they are today? We don't know. So what I want to get across to you today is that climate science has still got a lot to do and it's going to be incredibly challenging. So let's start with just a very simple introduction, just in case there are those listening who don't know what a climate model is. Well, it's actually a, not really a model in the sense of an empirical model or a statistical model. It's actually a simulator. And it simulates the atmospheric and ocean flows based on fundamental laws of physics. And we've been doing this ever since the birth of weather forecasting models and climate models in the uh, late 1950s and into the 60s. And in fact, I was started my career building climate models. And what we do is we cut the Earth up surface into grids, a grid of squares, typically of length about 100 kilometers. So think about that as quite big. And we slice the atmosphere and ocean into vertical slices, typically around 70 slices. And that allows us to have uh, thousands, even millions of volumes of the atmosphere and the ocean 
spread across the globe, which gives us a three-dimensional picture of the state of the atmosphere and oceans at any moment in time. And then we use very sophisticated mathematics to in integrate the equations of motion, uh, thermodynamics and radiative transfer forward in time, which tells us how our physical system will evolve as it interacts and feeds back on itself and how the flows evolve. And that's actually been the basis of the IPCC climate models right from the very start. And that sounds all very well. Um, and the simulations are really quite extraordinary. But the big problem is, of course, that not everything fits nicely into a 100 kilometre grid. And the biggest challenge for us as climate scientists over the decades has been how to represent key processes in our models that are not adequately resolved by that 100 kilometre grid. And of course, the most challenging of these processes are related to clouds and uh, where they form, how they evolve in time, how they produce rainfall, um, how they drive actually the dynamics of the system, because as clouds form, they release latent heat, which alters the wind. So there's that symbiotic relationship between where latent heat release happens as condens water condenses in clouds and rain is formed, and the winds that actually the circulation that drive the formation of the clouds in the first place. So this is a very complex system, and we've continued to struggle with this. And uh, I mean, he, he, here in this box here is just a little example of the sorts of things that I was just talking about, that the clouds and the circulation at scales that are finer than the 100 kilometer grid of the model are actually intimately related and, and play together to produce uh, the end results, which could be a tornado or it could be um, a thunderstorm and so forth. And so what we find is that despite all our efforts, cloud feedbacks, in other words, the climate sensitivity of the planet to increasing carbon dioxide, the changes in rainfall that will occur as the planet warms and changes in extreme weather, such as the uh, little figure I have in the box on the right, remain very uncertain. And I think what it comes down to is that we don't understand what the future of our water is. So I've just been talking about clouds and rain bearing systems and the intimate relationship with the circulation. And I think we, start, we need to start being honest, much more honest than we have been, that climate change is not just about temperature. In fact, in many respects, it's more about what will happen to our water. After all, water is Earth's lifeblood, and our future will be dominated by water. Too much, too little, at the wrong time, in the wrong place, the impacts are, will be profound on our economics and our, on our, our societies. And we know, as we've already seen uh, over the recent years, hydrometeorological extremes are among the most costly impacts of, of climate change. And we have every expectation that the intensity of those extremes and certainly the frequency is likely to increase. So how are we going to manage uh, those effects and reduce our, uh, our exposure to disasters? And then just thinking about, well, not just us, but all life on, on this planet. We can just think through all the things we see from looking outside our windows, indeed, that changes in seasonality and the variability of rainfall can profound, have profound effects on living systems. And I know that because I'm a keen gardener. Um, but many, many natural ecosystems and um, networks of life uh, depend absolutely on the regular regularity of our rainfall and we're disrupting that and then finally bringing this closer to home in terms of um, our getting to net zero of course the terrestrial carbon cycle which we rely on so much to take up a significant fraction of our emissions is controlled by the water cycle 
So if the water cycle changes, will the efficacy of the carbon uptake change? And again, we don't know. So there's some big issues around here. So I want to talk about water uh, this in, the, in this presentation. So let's just look at what the models do. So um, just a few, few bits of, of information from the latest um, assessment report, what we call the CMIP-6 models that underpin the sixth assessment report. And this, is, this just shows what they think uh, the annual mean rainfall climatology looks like for today. And we can see, if you're a, a climate scientist like myself, you can see the familiar uh, concentration of rainfall over the Indo-Pacific, what we call the warm pool, the high, high ocean temperatures of the Indo-Pacific region around Indonesia, spreading across the tropical um, Pacific, north of the equator. And of course, we can see hints of the monsoons of India and Africa and the storm tracks of the northern and southern hemispheres. So that actually, at broad brush, looks pretty good. But if you then go on and say, well, what is the bias of that simulation against present day observations? Then it looks like this. And I'm not going to talk about the pattern per se today. All I want you to take away from this is that the scale is quite similar to the scale of the climatology of the models and that the biases are substantial fractions of the mean. In other words, these models still have some really, really big problems in simulating today's observed distribution of, of rainfall around the tropics. And actually, we also know that that is true spreading up across, say, the Great Plains of the US and other places. And these biases are really not small. And that and if you're thinking about the implications then for agriculture, for forests and so forth, uh, we have to be a bit concerned. And we become even more concerned if we compare that top figure with what we expect the climate change signal to be in precipitation when we double CO2 concentrations. And the, the main point here is that the signal we're looking for is much, much smaller than the size of the bias. And that's really concerning. And so it's not actually really surprising, therefore, that when we go into the sixth assessment report, um, that, and, and look here, this is a draft figure, because the full figures are not yet released, the draft figure of the seasonal changes in rainfall for a a medium emission scenario by the end of the century compared with present day. And what you can see here, there are some big areas of increased rainfall and big areas of decreased rainfall, but much of the map is hatched. In other words, the models do not agree on the sign of the change, um, let alone the magnitude of the change. And so our future projections of rainfall are dominated by uncertainty. And this has not changed over successive IPCC reports going back at least to the third assessment 20 years ago. And so many of us in the science community have, th have been thinking over the recent years of how do we break this deadlock? What is going on here? We have spent an enormous amounts of time trying to improve our models. But yet this particular aspect of our models remains stubbornly intractable. And I think what it comes down to is that when we think about weather and climate, it's all about interactions across scales. And we've been working with a 100 kilometer grid. At the beginning of my career, it was a 250 kilometer grid. But actually what's really going on is that the energy cascade comes, is involving much scales that are much, much finer than those of our current climate models. So about sort of 15 years ago or so, I started to play around with this with my research group at Reading University. And we started to investigate what sort of 
how, how would our weather and climate simulations look if we could actually resolve many of what we think are the energy cascades in the system? Now, this idea isn't new, of course, because Lewis Fry Richardson, who was the pioneer of numerical weather prediction, wrote um, a very long time ago, big worlds have little worlds which feed on their velocity and little worlds have lesser worlds and so on to viscosity. So he understood that energy cascade from the large scale to the small scales. But what we've understood in recent years is that it's equally an energy cascade from the small scale to the large scale. And actually, you can see this wonderfully in this simulation. of This is of, a, of an actual typhoon, um, and it's actually a really skillful simulation. And it starts from a very coarse initial state. You can see that fuzziness at the beginning of the simulation. And the model is able to, the physics is able to generate all sorts of fine scale structures which come together to produce a hurricane with a very distinct eye. And so it sort of encouraged me to sort of plagiarize Lewis Fry Richardson and say that actually our problem in climate model is, is that little worlds the little clouds drive the bigger worlds, which draw upon their energy. And bigger worlds drive regional weather and so on to climate sensitivity. And I think it's that upscale energy cascade that we now understand as being so vitally important uh, for determining not just our rain bearing systems, but also actually aspects of our regional weather and climate. So, We've worked away at this over a number of years and um, we're now at the stage where we can actually do this at the global level. And this is just a snapshot of what we now call a global storm resolving model. And it's uh, a kilometre scale simulation. This one was produced by the Max Planck Institute at Hamburg by a very leading scientist there, Bjorn Stevens, who's really pioneered this effort. And this picture is a simulation, a snap, instantaneous snapshot of the clouds generated by this kilometre scale model. And it is absolutely remarkable. The realism in this image is amazing. And if you're a meteorologist like myself, you can see all sorts of things that we know are not there in the IPCC models. We can see the clouds over... The we over West Africa and into the Sahara there, these big thunderstorms that form, we know that they're there. We can see some really interesting clouds over the Great Plains of the US, which we know the climate models that we currently have completely fail to produce. So there are all sorts of wonderful, other wonderful structures uh, to be seen in this image. And... Uh, do they matter? Well, I'm afraid they do. So this is a very interesting paper that was published by the UK Met Office a couple of years ago, where they looked at the future climate of West Africa. And what's so interesting about this example is that we can see over the West African Sahel region that the clouds are, that the weather is, is put together by uh, what we call mesoscale convective systems, big clusters of thunderstorms, widely separated in space, and they propagate uh, westwards um, across, the, across the continent. And <coughs> because of their high variability, this region, of course, is already highly vulnerable to drought and extreme rainfall. If we now look at, well, what, what, would, what do the models think will happen to this climate in the future and we compare what we would get from a 25 kilometre model already a big step up from our IPCC models with a four kilometre model that's really beginning to capture explicitly this symbiotic relationship between the heating and the winds that I talked about we can see that the indicators for their future climate for Africa are quite different the top figure on the right shows the changes in um, rainfall intensity, hourly rainfall intensity, um, and you can see that the red curve shows a shift. The x-axis is the 
the rainfall intensity in millimetres per hour, and it's a logarithmic scale, so we can see that there's a shift um, to much bigger contributions from very extreme rainfall amounts of well in excess of 10, 20, 30 millimetres an hour, compared with a coarser resolution model where that shift is far less dramatic. Similarly, if we look at the changes in dry spell duration, we can see that the four kilometre model has captured, uh, showing is showing much greater increases in longer uh, dry spell durations than the, the 25 kilometre model. And the reason we would trust the four kilometre model so much more is that it's more accurately, accurately captures the present day frequency and intensity statistics of rainfall over the Sahel region. And when we have that sort of system, we then see that actually the climate change signal is quite different and actually in many ways indicates a more challenging future. So these things do matter uh, very significantly for how we manage our future and particularly for the developing world. So why haven't we done this before? Well, the scale of the challenge is immense. Um, we need uh, exascale computing and data analytics to really exercise these global uh, kilometre scale models, storm resolving models. And here's just some numbers that we have to live with. So 50 kilometre grid. Remember, I talked about the, the size of the volumes. Typical state of the art climate change sim simulation. 17.5 million volumes. We need to be really at two kilometers, which gives you 10,400 million volumes. That's the prototype global storm resolving model. So the number of volumes goes up, in, as you can see, um, not quite exponentially, but, uh, but, but very significantly. But more importantly, actually, the time step of the simulation has to come down for numerical stability. So we find that each time we halve the grid length, the computing and data requirements increase tenfold. And that's why we haven't gone there yet, because to do this, those nature of those simulations, which we need actually to tell us about drought and to tell us about hurry, future hurricanes and typhoons, we actually need a machine, a dedicated exascale machine and so we've been calling uh, for a new era of international cooperation and collaboration, a CERN, if you like, for Earth System Science and Services, because we believe that actually no nation alone will solve this problem. It's not only a computing and data challenge, it's actually an intellectual scientific challenge. Building those types of models is not for the faint hearted. Um, so what might that look like? And I, I thought this was useful to show to you because actually I can see uh, Microsoft fitting in many parts of this, the endeavour that we think we need to pursue now. And the concept is around international earth system science centres, either a single centre or maybe a federated set of a few centres around the world. It's about bringing nations together around a shared endeavour to answer that question of where are we taking this planet in the next few decades, uh, regardless of how, whether we can get to net zero or not. And in here you can see that the engine room of this centre has to be an Earth System Science Laboratory, an exascale computing and data facility, but actually somewhere where actually there's also uh, innovation, technological innovation in how we develop our codes and test our, our models, particularly in the context of um, changing supercomputing architecture. And an open lab where we can explore new com computation and data technologies like AI and machine learning. I think they have a huge role to play in our Earth system models. And then beyond that, of course, there are other activities, when you have built these storm resolving models, what do you do with the information that they produce? And I think that's a whole area where we have to be much more innovative in the way that we do this. 
not use the old IPCC methods of intercomparing and so forth. We need seamlessly to be taking those data, passing them through what I call translational science, for example, flood models and so forth, using informatics and, and, and other data technologies to translate our data into services. And then finally, of course, science is no good unless it provides solutions. And I think at the end of the day, our solutions so often have to be at the very local level, well be below the kilometre level. And so we still need to think about downscaling. And actually, I think the revolution in digital twinning is immensely relevant here as a tool for local decision making. So this is the vision. Uh, we're beginning to socialise it around the international community. We're beginning to talk to decision makers about this. It will be a big change. But I think the end result of this vision that we have to take our science through to really, really um, meaningful solutions is, is, has huge potential. So if we can make this quantum leap to next generation storm resolving models, we will have the capability to predict future hazards. And then when you fuse that with real and synthetic data across the hazard and risk continuum, you have that opportunity using AI machine, machine learning to really marry the, the hazard with the systems that will be exposed to those hazards. And finally, I think, of course, digital twins, very fashionable. Um, but, you know, obviously, if we can go from, uh, eventually, from the hazard through exposure and vulnerability to socioeconomic consequences through digital twinning, I think this could revolutionise how we estimate and manage risk. And, of course, essentially, our global storm-resolving model is essentially a digital twin of the physical climate system. And that has to be our starting, starting point when we think about building digital twins for dealing with climate risk. So I think there's some exciting opportunities in the next decade to really harness um, the, the digital revolution that's going on. But we need to make sure that at least for climate risk, it's embedded in some very, very solid science and particularly very solid science that has to do with the future of our water. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I think next generation climate modelling, a very exciting prospect, one that fundamentally is actually really all about, all about helping us to live safely and sustainably on our planet. Thank you.